Hello and welcome to the fourth of our Ask Julie events for the Good Grief channel. I'm Liesl Dawson, a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol. And today we're talking about grief after the death of a child. I'm delighted to welcome Julia Samuel, one of the UK's leading psychotherapists and the best-selling author of Grief Works and This Too Shall Pass. Before we get started, I just want to remind you about the structure and practicalities of the webinar. Like the other sessions, tonight's discussion will be divided in two halves. Julie and I will speak for about half an hour um, and then we'll have another 30 minutes to answer questions. So quite a lot of questions have already come in and you'll also have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. But I should say in advance that I don't know if we're gonna get through all of them and I apologize if we miss you but Julia does have a live Instagram coming up. So we could also, you could ask those questions then. Um, please feel free to say hello in the chat. We really love seeing the conversation happening in other webinars and also feel free to share resources with one another. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available afterward on the Grief Channel. So welcome, Julia. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. And of course, it's an incredibly painful and difficult subject. Um, so hello to everybody that's that's watching. And I, I don't know the reasons why you've joined, but um, thank you for joining. And I hope we can give you some insights into your experiences for whatever reason that you've that you've joined and of course when a child dies there are no answers so it's just from my experience of working with families you know I worked in an NHS hospital supporting families when a child died for 25 years so all I'm talking about is my experience and this may fit with yours and be useful or it may not but um, I'll tell you my thoughts. Great, thank you. Can I start by asking you to talk a little bit about what the unique challenges are, the emotional challenges that we face after the death of a child? I mean, there are many unique challenges. You know, thinking about the death of the child is unbearable to even think about, let alone to experience. And it tears up the rule book of life. You know, you should never have to bury your child. Um, as many families have said to me, you know, I would never have dreamt I would ever have to choose a coffin for my own child and go to the funeral of my own child. It's just beyond kind of comprehension as an experience. And so when you've torn up what you normally would predict in life, that your child would bury you, what dies with that often or gets broken with that is your innate trust in life. Like if something out of the blue, where is it, whether it was a diagnosis and the child finally di eventually died or it was a, a, a sudden death, your trust in, in life going forward and the picture that you expected from life dies with the child. And you, as a, as a mother and father, are kind of thrown into this alien world where there's no map. You don't know where you're going. You don't really know who you are or what you believe in. And you can't imagine how you're gonna live your life and imagine your future without your child. Because the moment your child was conceived, you kind of dreamed of the life that you were gonna have. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about the death of the child, I talk about, I, I mean it in the most kind of inclusive sense that this could be a miscarriage, it could be a stillbirth, it could be a neonatal death, and it could be the child of any age. And the death of a child, whether it's an adult child, is always the death of your child. So, I mean, I think often people kind of limit it by certain things, and, and, and I don't. I, I mean it in the broadest of senses. Can you say a little bit about how the death of a child impacts our sense of self and who we are? I mean, it's, it's very, like with all of these things, it's very unique. I think one of the words that I hear most 
common is that it feels like a fathomless hole in myself, like who I was has been kind of blown apart. And um, it shifts your identity. You may be, you're always a parent, but it's how you negotiate your sense of self as a parent to a child that's died and also to a parent, maybe to other children. Um, and so it's finding, as I said, trust in life, but purpose and meaning in life when you no longer have that child to care for and to see them progress through life is, I think it feels fragmenting to, as, your, as your sense of self. And certainly from my experience, it takes the longest to begin to rebuild your life and find a way of daring to trust and live and love again. It, it's, it's a long process. So it's a sort of, you lose a sense of who you are, a sense of purpose, and also the wish for future for yourself and that child. Could you say a little bit about how the death of a child can impact a marriage and also the wider family structure? So the death of a child, you know, it affects so many people, the aunts and uncles, the close friends, of course, the parents, um, the couple, the mother and father, whether they're together or, or they're separated, and the grandparents. And in that, that family structure, often the grandparental role um, is very important and it can be pivotal as the grandparent one kind of step away to support the family when the, when the parents are so significantly bereaved. But also it's complicated because the, the child of the grandparent will look at the, their, their parents and their child is still alive and they, it may create envy that you still have a live child. You've had me for 40 years or 50 years and my eight-year-old died. So it, it can create all sorts of complexities and difficulties within the family unit. Within the first year um, in a family, a couple is 70% more likely to need psychiatric care. So it's the most psychiatrically um, harming, if you like. You know, you it takes a lot of resilience and, and robustness to, to weather the death of a child. Um, and some of the research also showed that when because it's so unbearable, some people tend not to want to face it. And they may look the same as other couples for the first few years of life. But then later in life, the process that they haven't grieved can come and hit them and they can have, you know, severe psychological disorders. Um, so it's, it's potentially, I mean, the, I think the message I'm, I'm saying is that I think grieving the death of a child is too difficult to manage on your own. I think you really need professional support. And I would always encourage people to get professional support because it is so complicated and, and, and so painful. Do you think there are different challenges that are faced by mothers and by fathers following the death of a child? I mean, the, I think they are different. I think how I see it is that grief is often one of the images for grief is an iceberg and the third that you see on top is what people show and what they say and what they look like and the two thirds of the grief below the waterline of an iceberg is what you don't see and I think the levels of pain that men and women feel are the same very much the same the intensity of the loss the pain of it I think the research shows and certainly my experience backs it up is that men and women tend to grieve differently so from the strobing shoot dual process men tend to be restorative they tend to want to get on with life women tend to be loss oriented so the dual process is that the theory the process of grieving is that at the moment of the death you have two instinctive responses to be loss oriented and to be restor restoration oriented and that you oscillate between the two and you move you need to move between the other so that by having being restorative and a break from the grief gives you the emotional energy to go back and do some of the loss work and face the reality of the death. Women tend to be loss oriented and ruminate and go over the death and men tend to be um, restorative. They may want another child quicker than the woman. 
And that different way of grieving can cause conflict in the couple. Um, and so I often tell them about the dual process and that is very helpful for them because then they understand that he's not being like this thought, you know, insensitive person and she isn't this kind of wet rag. And I encourage them to find ways to help each other to do a bit of the other so he can help her have some hope for the future and she can help him have a focus for their grief. Mm. Um, and sort of understanding that given how abnormal this process is, that they, um, what they're feeling is normal, I think is important. My other thing about couples is I think really you need support as a couple. So when I was at St. Mary's, I always encouraged the, the couples to come. It often the women presented themselves and wanted um, support, but I would encourage them to include their husbands or partners um, because it's a, it's a systemic family, massive loss and the whole system needs recalibration. So um, you need to find ways of processing that and aligning with each other through that if you're gonna rebuild. So, so you give the impression that, you know, you have the pain of the death of, of the child, but also that some of the problems come from the differences in the way that the parents grieve and perhaps misinterpret, you know, what they see is, you know, not grieving or not feeling enough as just being a kind of different mode of grief and a lack of communication. Would you, would you say that's I think a that, I think, issue? I think because you're, you, you're, capacity to tolerate each other's differences is diminished when you're grieving. So you kind of want people to be the same as you, or you want to feel um, that what you're feeling is, is normal. So when you see your partner doing it differently, it can feel wrong. And so I very, yeah, I agree that it's to allow difference and not to criticize it. Mm. Um, and if in the relationship there were pre-existing fault lines, those fault lines are likely to kind of rupture. So, I mean, one of the things that I heard many times from clients was that they were told they were very likely to break up if a child died. And I thought that was incredibly unhelpful to tell people. I mean, I would say the reverse is that in some senses, only you, these two people can really know what this experience is like. And so there's something about that as agonizing and terrible as it is that you share something that no one can ever understand in the same way as you. And that finding a way of grieving and supporting each other together is your best way, is your best way forward. Can you say a little bit about how the death of a child impacts your other relationships? So extended family members, you've talked about a little bit, but what about friends or even socially? I mean, how long have you got? So you can, all of us, I think, as friends and family members of someone who's had a child die, don't know how to talk about it, don't know how to say it because it is so painful. And there can be this awkwardness that people sort of don't want to remind you that you're grieving the death of your child. So they don't say anything at all. Or they don't, they're scared of saying something wrong, so they don't say anything at all. And that is always devastating for families. And some people may not want to talk about what's happened to them, the death of their child, but they would certainly want it to be acknowledged. Um, and so the... But also it, you know, you may have a sister or a brother who's got four children and you had any, you had not only, you had one child and your child died. That creates incredible tension that you see other family members or close friends have what you most want and it feels incredibly unfair. And it's difficult for everybody. Um, your work colleagues can feel kind of very awkward around you don't know what to say. And so, I mean, the, my big message to anyone who's listening who has a, a friend or a family member who's bereaved by the death of a child is to acknowledge it and ask them what they need. Like you don't have to know and you certainly don't have to have a kind of magic sentence that's gonna make it better because nothing makes this better. But to say to them, um, I was, you know, wondering what is most helpful for you. Do you want me to do something practical? Do you want me to 
to do you want to come for a walk with me do you want to bring me to bring food shall I sit with you kind of make suggestions because that thing of sending a text saying let me know if I can help just feels empty um and annoying um so but also you know it's very individual texts can be really nice because talking and being with people can be very demanding and very difficult so you have to kind of harness and shape your response to this particular person and this particular family um but always do it checking with what they need don't think you have to know that's really helpful sasha bates in her book has a or maybe it's her new book she has a list of things you can ask people to do so that when nice. you get the yeah so when you get this sort of difficult text saying what would you like me to do she kind of has a nice list that you could go through and just sort of ping things off um, that's so nice it is it's quite helpful um how can you support your other children following the death of a child I mean I think it's one of the hardest things and you know what we know about bereaved children is that they need need the same truth as everybody in the family so often what um is, is experienced as protection, what is intended as protection for their children is experienced as um, disenfranchisement by the child themselves. So that they, in age appropriate language, they need to know, who, you know what happened, why it happened and all the information um, and that they can ask questions and that they can, be allowed to be, you know, sad, bereaved siblings, but also happy, normal kids. And one of the things that we often talk about, which I may have talked about in other talks, is that bereaved children, it's, the metaphor is like jumping in and out of puddles. So allow your child to be a very sad child, and then also allow your child to be a normal child and kind of get on with it and, and go to school. But often as the adults, we kind of say no 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 don't cry don't worry don't think about it where actually it is that they need to be allowed to be sad and think about it and ask questions yeah. um, but also get support from others because I think the outcomes for children is is dependent on the quality of the parenting of the children mm -hmm. so that's what's the single biggest influence on their outcome is 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 your parents and that can be enormous pressure when you're grieving. So help, get help from others, ask other people to come and take your kids out, to come and do things with your kids, because, you know, grief is physiological as well as psychological. People feel like their body has been hit and they often don't have very much emotional resource. They often feel like a layer of skin is missing and that they can't be very patient. Um, so it's, you know, it's incredibly demanding. Mm. There's lots of comments coming in just on the chat. And just to mention one that I've noticed from Nick, who talks about how when their daughter died at 26, the grief counselors would not see him and his wife together in counseling, which seems really strange to me. So he really sort of backs up what you say. But I would think if someone said that to you, I would find a new grief therapist yeah I think so, it's more that she couldn't cope with the couple rather than it's not right for the couple, couple yeah absolutely that seems very strange um can I ask why guilt is such a common you know painful emotion for parents who have lost a child I, I mean uh, you know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said guilt is the most painful companion of grief and it really is. And I think with the death of a child, there's this, and, and to remember anyone that's listening is that, in, that grief is an emotion. So don't conflate the feeling with the fact. And I think one of the things about grief, about guilt is that people feel guilty and then they jump to the conclusion, I am guilty, I did something wrong. But I think what's particularly complex as a parent is that the kind of definition of being a, a successful parent is having a thriving child. And so when your child has died, whatever the cause of death, there's this inexorable sort of fundamental sense of failure. And it may be that, you know, that the, the, it was nothing, they had absolutely no influence over the child's death, that this was a, a kind of 
uh, one in a million event that they had no control of, but they somehow people to go on this um, kind of Sherlock Holmes mission, trying to find a reason. Was it because I ate blue cheese when I was pregnant? Am I being punished for the abortion I had when I was 17? Um, and other kind of concrete things. But it's it, what I talk about with, with people when I see them is to hold their head and their heart side by side. Like you can't argue guilt out of one. You can't just say to somebody, you're not guilty, but to allow them to say and express their guilt, because I think that releases some of the guilt by naming it and it being acknowledged, not being kind of shoved back like you're not guilty, but also to cognitively think and say what they also cognitively know and to hold them both side by side, not trying to knock one out with the, with the other, if that makes sense. It does, it does. And I think in grief work, you talk a lot about how sometimes with guilt, you need to go through the guilt in a lot of detail to break it down, to examine it and to hold it up to, to, the, light. to yeah. the story of what's happened and that to try to get the, the kind of heart reaction to then come in line with your head. Yes. But I think there is a sense with these terrible losses that it is our fault somehow and that somehow we could do something to stop it. And, 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 it, and it could be very ifs. rational, yeah. Yeah, it's all the, those what ifs, a kind of tortuous, kind of rotating disc in your head that you can go mad with. And I think, I mean, sometimes I just use basic things like the, it's on my Instagram, but a, like a television screen where you put the image of the, of the difficulty on, you take a breath and you switch the channel. Um, and then you turn your attention away because sometimes the rumination can become embedded in your system and you sometimes have to use a kind of techno tool like, like the television screen to switch the channel. And the more you do it, the more likely it is that you stop. Yeah, yeah. I also think rituals really help. I think they help with so many things that they, because grief is invisible as everybody knows and it feels so kind of limitless. I think sometimes by creating a ritual, it can be a regular ritual, it could be one to represent a feeling that you have, whatever that feeling is, it can be to mark a particular time or date or, you know, but I think they really help give us kind of structure to this fathomless loss that people feel. Mm, that's really good. And I think I'd love to know thing, what other people think about that. If anybody yeah, wants. yeah, no, definitely. And one thing we've talked about also is, is telling the story from a different perspective, just because I think that we hold ourselves, we, we feel ourselves to be guilty for things that if the story was someone else's story, you know, we would say, of course, you didn't cause that. Of course, that's not your fault. And somehow shifting the perspective yeah. can sometimes allow us to see you know, the events more like someone else would see it. Like NLP. I mean, that's and, really nice. And more compassionate. Um, can, I just almost, add one, yeah. I, can I just add one thing is that the people who are watching and listening are really the experts. And, you know, we, we are having these conversations, but only you are an expert on yourselves and know your experience and know what you're having difficulty with. Um, but the big thing... I think that I would encourage, and this comes with guilt, is the guilt is is to turn to yourself with self-compassion. One, I think, one of the most cruel aspects of being a bereaved parent is how people kind of, not intentionally, but they can turn against themselves with fury and really attack themselves, and that that can make what's already devastating worse. So to you know, use Kristen Neff or any of the kind of tools for self-compassion to begin to be self-supportive. And from there, you're much more likely then to get the support that you need. Um, I think people often self-attack because they don't know what else to do with the pain. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what other people think about that. Um, can I ask you, we're almost to the time for questions, but before we get there, can you just give a few ideas for how we can start to make sense of our loss and begin to adapt to this new life? 
I mean, I think one of them is, you know, I don't think to some extent you can ever make sense of our loss. You know, there's the paradoxical theory of grief that I talk about in Grief Works, which is the more you find a way of living with and accepting what feels unbearable and unacceptable, the more likely it is that change will occur. Um, I think my eight pillars, which people can find on my website, are very helpful. They're kind of ways of the attitudes, behaviors, and ways of being that support you to kind of hold you steady. And some of it is things like exercise. Some of it is your relationship with, your, with yourself. Some of it is um, relationship with, with your child that died. And kind of it looks at different ways that you can explore that and support yourself to manage your emotions that you don't have control over and to kind of recognize you don't have control over them, but you need to get support for yourself to allow them. And the single biggest predictor of your outcomes is the love and support of other people, which is what's been so difficult in, in COVID. And my kind of big shout is that, you know, when you're grieving, your road through grieving should be paved with people. People need people all the time, but you need them most when you're bereaved. So don't punish yourself by pushing people away, even if you only have one or two people that you trust and you can bear to kind of come close, encourage them to be close. I think the other big thing is that is, is um, accommodation. Um, which Liesl might explain better because often you explain things better than I do, is that at the moment, at the time the, the child dies, it's like all you have is, is your grief. It's like this enormous black space. But over time, you the grief, the level of the grief and the, the hole from the grief doesn't change. But over time, you build your life around the grief. And sometimes you go back and revisit it even 15 or 20 years later and it can feel as intense. But a lot of the time, I talk about it being front of mind and back of mind. It's kind of further back in your mind and you can choose to go there. Whereas at the beginning, it's completely overwhelming. It's all, all that you think of. Um, and I think, I think, you know, hope is, you know, I think when people are initially bereaved of a child, you feel overwhelmed with despair, but we do need hope, even if it's a tiny flame and that it is hope that turns a life around. And so people need to allow just small flames of hope. And one of them is that knowing that as human beings, we are adaptive and we people do find it extraordinary ways of surviving and living even the death of a child. And I've seen that hundreds of times. Um, and that never takes away the level of the loss or the devastation of the death, but that people do find a way of living and loving again, even though that has happened. Hmm. And I think what goes along with hope is purpose, you know, feeling that you have a purpose to your life and something you know that, that that's bigger than you are i was i was looking around for your book because when you talked about accommodation you do have a nice visual image I, do, yeah. I didn't have it to hand of the kind of the circle which is the loss and it doesn't diminish but your life grows around the circle which is the loss so it's not that the loss shrinks it's less no. but that the life expands to accommodate yes. the loss yeah. that remains there um I was going to move to questions, but just to say uh, there was a question in the chat asking about the book I mentioned, and it was put in the chat, which is the Sasha Bates book. But I just want to say that I don't know if it's that book or the book that's coming out in September. That's what I can't remember. So she has another book called um, A Grief Journey, and that might have the list in it, but it's one of her books. So sorry, not to be more specific. Um, okay, so if we could jump into the questions. We do have a lot and we'll get through as many as we can. I want to start with a question about a family avoiding the topic of death. So um, the question is, or my grown-up son died suddenly six months ago. Some family members and some friends do not mention his name or seem willing to talk to me about him. I find this very hurtful. How do I respond to them and deal with this? I'm so sorry about the death of your son. I think, I mean, I imagine it's fear that's stopping them um, talk about him. And, 
you know, this this idea that, you know, the pain that they talk about is going to overwhelm them and, and either you or they won't um, manage it. I don't know what other people say. My suggestion is that you need to be straight with them. And maybe initially it would be by email that you'd say, you know, I, I really need to meet up with you and maybe go for a walk. And we need to find a way of talking about him. Um, and just be honest, because these are people that really matter to you and are important to you. And so I, I, I think if you can be kind of compassionate towards them, that whatever their reasons are, they have reasons, um, but you, that you can build bridges. And I know that you're the one that's bereaved, it's your child that's died, and somehow they should be the one who's doing the work and not you. But your relationships with them really matter. You, you know, I've seen many times close relationships break and be destroyed over the death of a child. And, you know, that's another injury you don't need. So if it, that may happen, and I hope it never does, but I would do what you can to be honest with them and say that we need to find a way of talking about it. And maybe one of the ways is by creating a memory box or a, a, a an album together so that you do it in actions or, or plant flowers in a plant plants in a garden so that you do it by doing something together that is a collective um, project. And so that it isn't just focused on the kind of devastation of the death, but can be something that's a bit lighter by being active. People sometimes feel less scared. Mm. Um, that's a lovely idea. And you can think about, you know, going to a spot that they liked or a football match or something that then brings their living presence yeah. into the conversation and provides a kind of way of talking I think that's, to memory yeah yeah but I also think you're right that we you know that sometimes sadly it's the person who's lost someone they love who has to educate everyone else about how to be a good support person and to say you know it is important that you listen to me and that we have conversations can I ask the next question which comes from a funeral director he or she asks, do you have any suggestions for a funeral director dealing with the funeral of a child? Anything you felt, you know, wasn't asked or considered that you would like to see happen? I mean, I think that would be much better answered by the families listening than I would know. Um, my guess is, you know, the fact that you're on the call, on the webinar and wanting to know more shows that you're probably the kind of person who would be good for those families because you're wanting to learn. And, you know, what families need is being someone who's sensitive and compassionate and empathic. It's probably the people who think they know it all that don't come to webinar like this, don't ask questions <laughs> that need to learn. Mm. Um, but... I don't know if other people want to put some answers in the chat of things they wish their funeral director. I see that we have Jane Harris here. Hi, Jane. Um, yeah, and they are part of the Good Grief Project. They started the Good Grief Project. They have the wonderful the film. film, but yeah. they also have a beautiful film that they did of their son's funeral. And I think in that film, the, the celebrant talks about how you need to, to separate out the burial from the funeral that funerals, to take time over the funeral, to make it personal, to make it creative, to not be limited by, you know, some kind of idea of what needs to happen and to really make that a celebration of the person's life. And I, I, I would say the more people you can involve, and I think it's one of the strengths of their film, you see their friends and community coming together and then they carry that with them as a supportive community for their grief. Yeah, that's lovely. So, yeah, I mean, I would recommend that film and their other work. Can I, I add one more thing? It's what you said, made me think of is that, I mean, obviously I'm not talking about COVID times, but in my experience, people tend to hurry to get to the funeral to kind of get it done. Um, because they kind of think if I've got this unbearable thing done, then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be all right. But my kind of shite is to take a lot of time. There's no hurry. The child has died. Nothing else can go 
you know, nothing terrible, the terrible thing has happened. And so to take the time to think about what kind of funeral you want, what you want to include, to change your mind, to think who, you know, how to involve your children, how you might separate the, the funeral and the, and the burial or the crema cremation, what you want the memory to be to, for, you know, one of the big things I often tell people is to film the, the funeral because you may not think you'll ever want to watch it or audio record it, preferably film because you, if you're the primary mourner, you often don't remember. Mm. Um, and or you that you have kind of flashes of memory rather than a clear narrative. So to take time into to allow yourself to explore lots of ideas, reject lots of ideas, and then come to a conclusion that you'll know when you look back of it, back at it, that even if there are things that you regret, that you did the best you could. Whereas regrets, when you've done it too fast, you think, well, why didn't I take longer? Why didn't I, you know, and that can be quite a derailer of the grieving process. Yeah, and a lot of people are sort of agreeing with this in the chat. Um, and someone, Kate, mentions the fact that the, the separating out the burial from the memorial and the funeral was really important. Um, so we have a question about the death of adult twin children. About a year ago, I lost my 37-year-old twin daughters wow. within three days of each other, both to COVID. Oh my goodness. Ever since they have died, I feel like a part of me has died too. Yeah. And the losses seem worse as time goes by. And I don't feel whole. I'm not the person I was. Does this ever get better? I'm so sorry this has happened to you. I mean, the devastating your two twins. Your two children have died, your twins. I think, I mean, other parents must come in, but I, in my experience, often, you know, such a tragic and sudden loss, the pain gets worse. So people often say that the first year was terrible, but the second year was worse. I, I don't know if this is helpful or not helpful to say it, but it's true because the reality, the shock, you, you know, you sort of have difficulty functioning, but the, and the shock in some, some extent numbs some of the pain, but the second year, the shock really does begin to wear off. Um, and, you know, my my cry to you is to get support, to get proper support that you cannot c come to terms or find a way of living with this, accommodating this, just bearing it on your own. You need to get proper support. You can go to Child Bereavement UK um, or other places that will support you. Mm, thank you. We've had quite a few comments and questions come in under miscarriages. So I'm gonna say a few of these together. The first from Sandra, I'm supporting a lady who's had multiple miscarriages. I don't consider the term miscarriage helpful as it infers something has been carried wrong. What are your views on terminology? And a sort of related one from Jennifer, my son was still born at 36 weeks and it was often referred to that I'd lost the baby. The phrasing doesn't help with the feelings of guilt. So again, stuff about lost and miscarriage, you know, what do you think about terminology? How should people be talking? about miscarriages and, and stillbirths? I mean, I think language really matters. And as you say, lost, you know, no, nobody got lost. No, I, I don't like passed away or passed. I, I don't like any of the words that don't use the word dead or, or dying or died um, because I find them in some way trying to make something better that you can't make it better because somehow it's a sort of step away. Um, and, I think language really matters when it's something so sensitive, you know, and I think doctors, I mean, there is change, but I think often obstetricians, you know, gynecologists often think the level of the loss is equal to the level of, to the number of weeks of, of the baby. And that absolutely isn't the case. It's the emotional investment in, in the baby. And if you've had one miscarriage and then you have another, you're grieving, you know, a new loss will always bring back the previous loss. Mm. Um, and so I think language matters. I don't think we can change the word miscarriage, but I agree it, it you know, and people talk about incompetent cervix, cervixes and, you know, I, there's another one somebody said to me the other day about their womb. 
something incompetent womb. womb incompetent womb yeah, yeah. No, they it's use that so... as well i know yeah no and it's to be honest it's similar about the language around death now i think because you know it's it's you lost the battle to cancer and the language of death is about you know inhospitable womb well said. in oh there we go thank you i got, I, got I, I think i've heard it it's elizabeth day well. said it to yeah. me in her podcast. But again, like as if death is avoidable, as if, you know, somehow dying is about losing a battle that you as, didn't as fight to, hard to, enough. Yeah. As opposed to something that actually we're all going to do at some point and is, you know, sadly um, a natural process. Can I can I also just take you to one other um, question about baby loss? We lost can I just say one more thing about miscarriage? Sure. The thing yeah. I kind of do with clients that have had miscarriages is I um, encourage them to do something that represents a loss. So with, this is public. So Elizabeth Day, um, this on my podcast with her, she had a miscarriage and I suggested she, she buy something to represent it. And so she had a piece of sculpture made and she put it in her garden. And that was very significant because it made what was invisible visible. And it was a place that she could go to and it kind of gave structure and I don't know if the word solidity to something that was so ephemeral and, and incohate and sort of agonizing having something solid that was engraved and mattered to her and represented the miscarriage was very helpful. Mm, that's really helpful and I think we do want something tactile sometimes to touch to connect us to the person we've lost died sorry right. I'm using it now um, and to feel connected to them um, can I, okay, here's another one. We lost our one and only pregnancy at the end of four cycles of fertility treatment and 12 years of trying to conceive. That was our one and only hope of ever having a child. The imagined child and the six week small bundle of cells with our child. The aftercare was atrocious. I was told the baby would be put in clinical waste and oh given a goodness. leaflet for how to try again. So it's really, it, it's, 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 it's as much a comment as anything about highlighting the loss of the imagined and hope for child. And I think that goes back to what you said about it's not number of weeks, it's about the love that you invest and have for the person. And then I guess- the, minute, we... the moment you have the blue line, you picture yourself as a family. Mm -hmm. you, you plan, you know, where you're gonna live, the, the baby seat in your car when you're going to stop work and so you're grieving the future you had every right to imagine and if you've had a lot of losses before that in the in the in trying to have a baby that's intensified even more so it's multiple living I call that a living loss I mean that the, the death of that little baby was a, a, a grief from death but the the failing to or not it's the wrong word I'm using the wrong word not getting pregnant mm. is a living loss and that is, you have all the experiences of grief, but it is often an in disenfranchised grief because it isn't acknowledged because people don't see it and they don't acknowledge it. Mm. We had a question come in about suicide and the, and the neurological causes. My beautiful 27 year old daughter took her own life in December, 2019. What actually happens in the brain when you're on the brink of suicide? Julia has said before, it's like a heart attack of the brain but I really want to understand a little bit more. Would my daughter have been past the point of no return and not realizing what she was doing? Do you want to answer? Because you, we've talked. Um, yeah, we did talk about this. So, I mean, I guess that this is short answer is you probably can't say for sure if you don't know the individual case, but I did find a, a very, I think, accessible article that brought together some of the recent studies of the neurology of the brain and so there's various things that they connect with suicide one is about a failure um, or deregulation of some of the stress responses so there's an HP, hpa axis which helps mediate the body's responses to stress and they've done studies that show that this stops functioning or or functions badly for people who um, commit suicide. There's also links with serotonin and neurotransmitters um, that show links with this. And finally, there's a link to neuroinflammation. 
So this is a, a sort of study from Denmark, which has a link between suicide and infectious diseases. So, I mean, there's a lot of studies out there. I think there'll be, someone will put in the chat um, the link to that, um, but there are studies out there. But I think, do you wanna just reiterate your main point, Julia, about the way to think about suicide? So this is from the work of Dora Black. Um, and what she talked about is, I mean, there was this program that I participated in last night of, of, of SAD, sudden um, death from a, from a heart attack that can come out of the blue. Um, and in the same way that you're suddenly your heart can stop working and not firing, she talked about it as a heart attack of the brain where there's like a sort of fire storm in the networks of the brain that stops the person being able to connect to other people and then takes their own life. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that, I think it's helpful in the sort of understanding of, because there's so, you know, we've talked about guilt, but there's so much guilt and what ifs and regrets with suicide that thinking about it from that kind of firing network being faulty, I think can be, can be helpful in the same ways that you wouldn't blame yourself if somebody had a heart attack. Um, I would encourage you to go to get support from SOBS or Papyrus um, from the, the James Wentworth, from James's place um, or any of the places where you get support because I think it's, it's, you know, it's incredibly intense, the grief from suicide. This question's from Anne. 10 years ago this May, my beautiful first daughter was born. She died as I gave birth to her. My only experience of knowing my little daughter in the flesh is one of grief. For many years, I've not been able or wanted to let go of the grief because it feels like letting go of her. Do you have any ideas about how I might go on holding on to her memory without the grief and trauma being so enmeshed? I mean, that I'm so sorry about the death of your little girl. And I, I mean, I've seen this very common because I, commonly because, and I wonder what other people think is that holding onto the pain keeps her close. And this, this, as you say, I've often seen it, this sense of abandonment um, that in order to show her how much I loved her and my life needs to stop and I just need to show her the pain. And in some ways, I'm really glad that you're asking this question because what I would encourage is that you give yourself permission to feel both, to move between having times where you kind of honor her and have your relationship with her and allow yourself to feel the pain, but also give yourself permission to engage with life and live your life and dare to trust and love again. And some of the ways I talk about that with with families is that is the is the accommodation but also this front of mind and back of mind is that that you have a place that you imagine your child is and that I think about that is you can have you can have her in the back of your mind and have in engage with your life see a friend do some work and then you can this is obviously further down in the grief not when at the beginning but then you can choose to visit her and you can have a touchstone to do that, a ritual, a piece, you know, a place that you go to, her room, a memory box, any of those things that can kind of connect you to her. Because as you've clearly said, it's never about, you know, forgetting and moving on. It's about remembering and loving her, but finding ways to love her that connects to her and that you feel close to her, but not so that you feel kind of frozen and not living your life. So to allow this oscillation between the two. Mm, that makes sense. And it, that I think answers another question we've had about how to mark um, birthdays and anniversaries, you know, how, you know, how to do that. And, and the other thing it, your answer made me think about is again, maybe partially because Jane Harris is on the call today is I know that they do things with, with, you know, pictures, or with art where you, you're kind of reinventing something every year, you're doing something new with the memory and that helps it to move along. And also the That's need lovely. for- I think create, being creativity is an enormous boon, if that's the right word, with your grieving is that you can find ways 
to represent your love for the person that's died and find creative ways that change and evolve over time. I think that can be incredibly healing and important to do. And, and again, it's this representation of them. The thing I find, and I don't know if other people think this, is that it's often the days leading up to the anniversary, whether it's the anniversary of the death or their birthday or Christmas, that they feel like Jaws music, the dum dum dum, and the actual day itself um, is never quite, is often not as intense. But I do think we need to plan those days. I think we need to honor them, not pretend they're not happening. And this whole thing about the body remembering, the body holds the score so that your body gives you information um, even if you're not kind of thinking about it, you can suddenly feel, people often talk about it, they feel funny and then they go, oh, I know why I'm feeling funny. And it's because it's the anniversary of the death. With your children dying, it's unlikely to have been something that isn't kind of engraved in your heart. But um, I think your body often gives you signals before you're, you're even ready. And um, that's really helpful. I mean, sort of related to that, do you have any specific sort of ideas for rituals that people can do and parents can do? This has come up in the chat and elsewhere. I mean, I, I think one of the things is to talk together as a family and have creative ideas, like sit around the kitchen table or go for a walk and think about, think about the person and what is meaningful for that person. Um, you know, I mean, some of the very simple things are often lighting a candle beside a picture, reading a poem, reading a prayer, cooking a meal. Um, uh, I think those are things I think of at the moment. Sometimes going into a church can be a ritual. Stones can be incredibly representative in that people often, they can have, have a number of stones that they put in particular places that then, and they can be engraved. Um, but rituals elevate and kind of honor, I think, the relationship. Um, so and I always what, think poems, yeah. prayers, candles, stones. That's what. <laughs> that's that's, what yeah, I no, think. that's lovely. And things you can do as well, I think. Um, what you say about family, I think, is important. And I guess for those people out there that might not have a family to turn to, community is still really important. And I know that I've seen and read how you know helpful it can be to sometimes come together with other parents who've had a similar experience that are often you need you know friends aren't doing it if you don't have family members who understand that finding a support group who really you can share Make stories about family. your child yeah yeah that can be really powerful um so we've had another one try which is about trying to keep in touch with a dead child's friends and partners this is from our, nice, yeah. our 38 year old lovely son, Tom was married for just over a year before he died. I want to keep the relationship going with our daughter-in-law, but she seems to struggle with this anniversary. And now um, two and a half years is in another relationship. I don't want to let her go, but my reason for hanging on to her is more about me trying to hang on to someone Tom loved. Do you have any advice about that? Um, I can see that that's really important. And I don't know whether you've explained to your daughter-in-law what you need um, in, and just being honest and straight and, and maybe say that maybe, you know, say how much that I think people, I think she may imagine that it's going to be overwhelming to see you, to see your sadness, and it will put her in touch with her sadness for Tom. And she's with somebody else and she wants to go forward with her life. And obviously that wouldn't mean forgetting Tom or not loving him, but she's, I guess, frightened of that you that you will kind of overwhelm her. So my suggestion would be to, to kind of make it very maybe ask her what she could manage that you re that you really want to continue the relationship with her and because it's so important because she, tom loved her and she loved tom and is there a way of meeting or a number of times of meeting that she could cope with that she thinks that she could do mm. that makes sense uh this question's about twin bereavement it's from ruth 
Do you have any experience of guiding a twin bereavement through different stages of life? My eight-year-old twin son died two years ago. We have professional support, but more in terms of parenting my surviving twin son. They were inseparable from birth. I don't know whether you know this, but the IVF um, pioneer, whose name I've now completely forgotten, he was the surviving twin of a twin that died. And he always said that the reason he ended up doing IVF was because he was the surviving twin. Um, and so, and, the, and I, I assume you know about the Lone Twin Network. Um, and my suggestion is, is that his relationship with his twin continues and finding ways to embody that, to represent that and talking to him about that. I don't know whether he, there's a teddy bear or something that his twin had that he can go to bed with. Um, the, the, there's quite a few good books, which I can't remember any of the names right now about surviving twins of twins that died. That might be worth reading. The, the Mike, Tim, Tim, Timothy Natchbull, I think he wrote a book called Out of the Clear Blue Sky when his, his twin brother died. Um, but also, you know, an eight-year-old boy would be creative and likely to have lots of ideas himself. You know, so it's finding ways of being creative with him. Maybe he's going to paint a picture to his brother, write postcards to his brother, but it's definitely about loving and continuing the relationship and acknowledging it. Yeah, I can even imagine a kind of scrapbook where the twin can find things that his brother would like or, you know, write little letters to his brother and share things and kind of carry that with him yeah. through his life, which would also be a record of his grief and his love. Yeah. And I, there's a beautiful moment in... Um, Oh, I'm good. Now I've forgotten a name. Um, our lovely photographer, Simon X, someone will remember me on the chat, who in love in his loved and lost project, there's a, a woman who's lost her parents and her brother. And she talks about how one of the joys she has is almost standing in place of them and looking at the world and being the witness for them. And I almost think nice. if you think in those terms and he thinks about him being the alive one for his brother and gathering the things he might love for him, it's a kind of beautiful way of being loving, but also grieving, I think, yeah, at lovely. the same time. Someone's re reminded me the name. It's Stepto, Professor Stepto. Oh, oh, he was the IVF oh, yeah. pioneer. Yes, there we go. So this is great for the, for the chat because they, they help us remember things when we forget. Oh, my brain is empty. <laughs> no. Um, so we have a question about the pre-bereavement period, or I don't even know if this really is the pre-bereavement period, it's the pre-death period. Please, could you talk about um, the period when you know a child is going to die? It's a roller coaster of symptoms which continue for months but without any real organized, formal, emotional support for parents for this time period. Is this too early for Child Bereavement UK support? No, it isn't. You can get support. So grief starts at the point of diagnosis, the moment that you know that the future for your child is going to be life lim limited or life threatened. You're grieving for the future you had every right to expect. Um, and yes, that is anticipatory grief. And, you know, I mean, there are many things to talk about, but one of them is that you definitely need support and you can get it from Child Bereavement UK, but also is talking to the child about their dying. That's one of the most difficult things, um, but often one that I have found that families have regretted not doing um, afterwards that they wished that they had, they're worried that their child was maybe frightened but had never talked to them about it. One of the things I, I've, I noticed a lot um, at St. Mary's was there is a kind of magical thinking when you have a dying child, which is that if I think about it or talk about it, it will somehow make it happen. So if I really love my child, I need to show them that they're gonna live and only have hope and not acknowledge the dying. But it sounds like you are acknowledging the dying. Um, and so I would get support for yourself and your family. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. Julia, you sometimes talk about 
analysis and or um, therapy as preventative medicine. Yes. And I would and I would think that getting support in, you know, during this period and the death yeah. of a child actually will help you, you know, get things as, as good as you can get them, which will make the grief, you know, that little bit less it, awful. It will protect you against regret. Of regrets. Yeah. 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 Um, we are out of time. We've had so many other questions. I'm Beautiful, sorry. I know, which we haven't gotten to, but we've had some lovely comments, um, great ideas that people have shared with one another of lovely things you can do to remember a child, to celebrate their life, and people really sharing lovely information. We were going to highlight the fact that you have a, 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 another live chat coming up next week i haven't decided but I, I i'll put it if you follow me on instagram i'll put it on instagram and i'll have a live chat where you can ask me and i'm just gonna i just feel so grateful for all of you joining and being so supportive of each other it feels such a precious community although such a painful one it feels very sensitive and very loving i can really feel how you support each other and i feel very honored to be a part of that me too Thank you so much, Julia, for your incredible wisdom and compassion as ever. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you, Liesl. You often filled in the gaps that I didn't have. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you, Good Grief Festival.